Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. All right. Um, <clears throat> we're excited. We are in chapter 22 of Matthew. And um, this is the parable of the wedding banquet. So it's kind of comes into play speaking about being married and and all that that was being talked about. And uh, so Deborah went and told on me about going to the doctor. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about that. I, uh, well, first, I just want to tell you, I have to tell you some kind of a joke, right? So you know what marriage is like? It's like two people smashing the trash down, hoping the other one gives in to take it out. That's what it's like. Or she's always standing in front of the drawer that I need to get in in the kitchen. Right? <clears throat> so uh, go to the doctor, right? And I and, uh, say, hey, you know, I'm not able to do the stuff around the house that I used to be able to do. I can't do it. I don't know what's wrong with me. So get a complete physical from the doctor. <laughs> said, okay, Doc, in, in plain terms, tell me what's wrong with me. And uh, so he says, well, you're lazy. There's nothing wrong with you. I said, yeah, so give me a medical term that I can tell my wife when I go home, right? <laughs> yeah. And she does. So we're looking at the parable of the wedding banquet today. And as we get into this, I, there's people that uh, this offends. And uh, it's not going to offend anybody who's in here. It just offends a lot of the people who are out there. Right? Amen? The people who really don't know about the Lord. Um, and we've been coming to a point here going through Matthew where the uh, the Pharisees and, the, and the, the teachers of the law have been coming against Jesus and now He's told three parables and this is the last one of the parables that He tells them. He, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. From uh, verse 1 to 14. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And he sent his servants to those who were invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner, my oxen." And my fatted cattle have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One went off to his field and another to his business. And the rest of them seized and mistreated the servants and killed them. And the king was enraged. <clears throat> he sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those who I invited did not deserve to come. So go into the streets and the, and the corners and invite to the banquet all, everyone who you can find. So the servants went into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, bad as well as good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But the king came in to see the guests. And he noticed that one man was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, my friend? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants to tie his hands and his feet and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. For many have been invited, but few are chosen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the sound of children in our church, Lord. That is such a blessing. We thank you for the testimonies, Lord. We just ask that you would give more testimonies to our people. Give more opportunities for them to share you as this week as we go. Bless this word and the time we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> you have been invited. In uh, this very first verse, all the way to three, uh, Jesus spoke again in a parable. Now we know about parables, right? We talked about that, why parables are used. Uh, there, uh, there's something that's in the world that you can understand, but and there's a spiritual truth to it too. And only the ones who are have the spirit of the Lord in them understand the parable plainly. And uh, I'm going to explain some of this today. And and it, you might hear something you've never heard before, and you might hear something you've heard but forgot. But don't tune out, because this is very important to all of us. Uh, no matter how many times a preacher preaches something about these wedding banquet uh, parables, it's always interesting what the Lord does through them. Amen? So the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. What does that mean? Parallel. Has anybody heard about that? There's a, a picture that I hung out in the kitchen right over the sink. And it says that the banquet's prepared. And it's a beautiful long table all set, ready to go. Well, the one thing I want you to see is that uh, it's prepared. It's already done. Okay? And these days, uh, when you gave an invitation to someone you didn't give them a date now see we're very timely we have to have a date we save the date has anybody got one of those save the date for a wedding save the date for this um, in those days they didn't have refrigeration they didn't have grocery stores they didn't have these types of things so they'd say okay that's the one i'm gonna slaughter let's fatten it up let's get her here feed it grain for so many days and get it big, and then we're going to slaughter it, and then it's got to, you know, it's going to hang for a few days or so, or whatever, it's got to be processed and all. So it takes time. So when you were invited to something, it was, if you said, well, when is it? Which we do, they would say, when it's ready. Which to us seems like a smart aleck thing to say, right? When it's ready. But that's the way it was in those days because they had to take time to prepare. And if you ever have studied any of the, the uh, traditions of that day, the Jewish traditions of wedding, um, it helps you to understand when you read these types of things because that's how it was written. That's how it was written from. Or uh, the bridegroom would go and prepare a place on the father's house. The father's house would have everything, would be, you know, the dining area, the kitchen, everything would be there. And the, the male who was going to get married would go and prepare a place on the house for to sleep. Everything's still done in the father's house. But now he has a wife and he's going to start a family and that's where his family is going to start. And it has a... My father's house has many rooms. Same type of situation. So you didn't know when he, when he went to go start preparing the house until that was done, that's when he came back. That's why the bride didn't know when the groom was going to come. She constantly has to be ready. That's what we're called, to be ready for his return. These things make a lot of sense when you read the traditions of those times. So it says that the king 
has prepared this wedding banquet for his son, the king. Now when I I read this, I automatically think God, his son, the marriage supper, Jesus, us being the bride of Christ. So when I read it that way, that's having the mind of Christ, the Spirit of God in you, knowing a little bit about Scripture, you can see how this is going to speak in a spiritual way rather than just a wedding banquet that you're invited to. That's why I named it, You Have an Invitation. And we're going to see what people do with it. Some people reject it. Uh, Some people don't even know it's there yet. Right? That's our job. So he sent his servants, in verse 3, to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. What is that speaking about in particular? That's speaking about the the Jews. Uh, the, The Pharisees. They were using the law. That was how they did. When Jesus came, they refused Him. No. When He turned the table over and the money changers. Now, how? who gave you authority to do this? Because now, that's our living. That's how we get money. How are we gonna, What are we going to do now? You took this away from us. Um, in the same way that God did things in Exodus against the gods of Egypt with the plagues, taking each one of them away, Jesus has done with the law and the righteousness that we gain from ourselves from the law. He's taken these things away. He's done away with them. He's peeled them back. This, if you've gone through that and you know that in your heart, this is this is really an exciting thing to see. They refuse to come. Now, who refused to come already at this point? Before we read any more, who refused to come? The, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They refused to listen to John and now they're refuting Jesus. They refuse to come. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, uh, we must pay the most happens to us. <laughs> it's happened to me. <clears throat> Since the message spoken through angels was binding. And every violation and disobedience receives its just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? That's what this invitation is. How shall we escape? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, the King, was confirmed to us by those who heard him, all the apostles, the Isaiah. We're going to read a lot out of Isaiah today. God, who testified to it by signs, wonders, various miracles, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This just kind of tells you and gives you gives you a, a narrower way of looking at this. How could we deny this salvation? It's like I was reading this and, and last week I, I saw some things and I started going, oh, Willy Wonka, you know, the golden ticket. Um, he is our golden ticket. He is all there is. And you have, uh, the picture came into my head this morning was somebody drowning. And you're the only one there. And you've got a life preserver. And you can throw it to them. And they go, no. Nope. I don't want that. God's going to save me. What do you mean? This is the only way you're going to get saved. Look around. No, God's going to save me. Not man. But God sent a man to save you. So it's uh, it's not to, not to say though, not to get straight away with that we can save someone. We can't, but we can have we can share the message that saves someone. 
Amen? And that there's nothing on us that has to do with that. In 4 through 5 here, it says, Then he said, uh, Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. It's already done. I've prepared it. My oxen and the fatted cattle have been butchered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Come to the wedding banquet. You know, <clears throat> we always do things and say things and we think sometimes, you know, I got to get my life right. I got to get these things all in order. I've got to get this. I've got to get that. I'll do something if I hit the lottery. Then I'm going to do something great for the Lord. You know, that, and that's what a lot of us do, unfortunately. Um, we, we can't wait until we have everything in line to come to Him, right? We come to Him, we need to be broken. We need to be empty. We need to not have everything right, right? And, and keep in mind, this is not like we do. This is not a potluck. Everybody bring a dish. This is already finished. It's ready to go. All you got to do is come. Right? All you got to do is accept the invitation. After that, when you get there, everything you're going to be, everything's provided for. Everything is done. It's exciting to me. I don't know if it bothers any of you guys about that, but I decided to walk with the Lord a long time ago. He'd been calling me forever since a young boy. Saved me out of lots of things. I should have passed on several accidents before. But not. He has something else for me to do. He has something, someplace else for me to be and someone else for me to share with. Come, it is ready. In, in verse 5 it says, but they paid no attention and they went off one to his field and another to his business. How does that happen? That, and we do it, everybody does it. There's people all over this world right now doing it that deny the message of God, that don't walk to the calling of God. And it's there for every one of us. Right? It's there for every one of us. We're too busy. You know, I've been places and I'll come up and, and uh, in the store or whatever and uh, see somebody from church and they'll say, yeah, we've just been really busy. And if you've said that to me, I'm not pointing out because I don't remember. And I think sometimes, oh, why are they saying, why are you saying that? Because I don't know. Sometimes you don't know if somebody's going to another church or what. They just you don't see them anymore. You may call them. Sometimes people come a few times and then we don't have their number yet, and then they don't come back. And I see them. Oh yeah, we love church. We just haven't been back because we've been busy. That's what these people are doing. I've been working so much. I've been doing this so much. All those things are way. And and this is this is a part that hurts. You tend to do what is most important to you. Right? You tend to focus on what's most important to you. What's the most important thing in your life? And that may not be coming to church, but if it's not coming to church, uh, for me, I have to be here every time the doors are open. That's what I need as a human being, as a man. But if you come into this, nobody can refute that. If you are reading His Word, and you're in your house, and you're singing His praises in your house, that's, that's between you and Him. He knows that, and He loves that. He's waiting for you to talk to Him. Amen? So, uh, we don't want to reject that message. Number one, the first that we read, they ignored the invitation now. They refused to come. 
It's a sad place to be in Luke chapter 17, verse 25 through 30. But first, he suffered many things and had to be rejected by this generation. He suffered many things. This is speaking about Jesus. Uh, Actually, I believe it's in red, but we don't have that. Anyway, just as it was in the days of Noah. Yes, this is Jesus speaking. So also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. Now, I want you guys to see that. It says days. There's one or two translations out there. The New Living uh, Translation doesn't have days. Uh I'm not sure exactly what it says. During the times, maybe, but it's worded different. But that says days. And as we go down, I want to point something out to you about this passage also. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed all of them. In that same, it, it was in, it was, I really got it. <coughs> Sorry, I had to clear my throat. It was the same in the days of Lot. Days of Noah, days of Lot, days of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, Fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. So there's a time when we're under Jesus. There's a time where we have to speak to Him. We have to to be with Him. Just like Noah. Noah had a message. People were wondering, what's he doing building that boat? It hasn't ever rained here. Uh, Lot, during Abraham's time, Abraham Abraham had a message. Lot went into this place and he fell underneath it, but he still had a message that he needed to deliver. Now we're in the days of Jesus. It's encouraging to me. Eating and drinking and being given in marriage and marrying until the flood came. We go about our days, we we get busy, busy with social life, busy with work, busy with all the things that that we have to do. And uh, we don't really get busy with the things we have to do. Meaning, what Jesus wants us to do. What What does He have for you in your life? Rejecting them. In verse 6 of Matthew, it says, The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. They rejected him to the point of killing him. Now, what this is a foretelling of what's going to happen and what has happened to God's servants that he sent to speak to the people. Uh, It's also in the parable of the tenants that were farming the land. He sent the servants out and they beat them, mistreated them, killed one of them. He sent more servants out. So being a servant of God is not always a lap of luxury type of thing, right? People say, uh, and I've said it myself, uh, working for God doesn't have a great uh, paycheck, but it has a wonderful retirement plan, right? <clears throat> now that I'm closer to retirement, I I, I, uh, I understand that better. Amen? So John uh, chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because of their deeds. Their deeds were evil. 
Everyone who does evil hates the light. Wow. That's tough. And will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Hmm. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Does that mean that God doesn't see what's done in the dark? No. God sees everything. He knows what's done in the dark. But if you're doing what you're doing in the light, in the truth, God especially sees that. That's what He wants. That's what He's looking forward to. But they don't come into the light because for fear that their evil deeds will be exposed. So why are these guys fighting so bad against Jesus? Why is He giving them chance after chance, telling them this way, telling them that way, the same story? Uh, I had a guy say, hey, uh, you know, I hadn't seen him in a long time. He said, oh, you know, I've been busy. And uh, he said, over there, over there at that church, or, uh, you're the preacher now. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, are you like them other preachers? Keep repeating and repeating and repeating the same thing until it's pounded in my head. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you come find out? Because I don't know. That's four I don't knows. Wait a minute. Maybe I am. Maybe I do. <clears throat> but I don't know, you know. Anyways, haven't seen him yet, but one day. I better have an answer for him, huh? So, why don't they want to come into the light? Why don't they want to walk by the truth? Why do they want to hide? Because they don't want to be exposed. They don't want to be exposed. They don't want the things that they do, the things that they think, the things that they twist around to, to manipulate people or whatever. They don't want that exposed. Um, basically, you can, you can pretty much say as a blanket, we all have some of that in our lives. Right? But does it outweigh the good? Is it, are you completely covered with it? You know? Are you, are you st is that blanket just down around your feet? Time change. <clears throat> Only the white man will fold a blanket in half and pull it up. That's what, it was an Indian deal. Only a white man will fold a blanket in half and pull it up when he gets cold and push it down. Time change. I thought they were going to get rid of that. <clears throat> yeah, it's funny. This time change, you don't hear anything about it, right? I was here at 5.30 this morning. I thought it was 6.30. <clears throat> and that was okay. I mean, I love coming here. But, uh, you know, on, on, when it changes forward or back, when it springs back, uh, yeah, okay. That one. <clears throat> Man, it's weeks. My wife is like, oh my gosh, this time change. I'm like, it's an hour. It's an hour. Oh, this time change. I just can't do anything. Fly where you fly somewhere and you leave at night and you fly and it's still night. That'll mess up your body, not one hour. Come on. I know. <clears throat> so they don't come into the light because they don't want their evil to be exposed. So that gives them an anger. That makes them angry. Now, and also too, so you know that uh, 35 to 40 years after this, uh, Israel, uh, Jerusalem, was uh, overrun by the Roman army. And smashed and burned this is the very city that he's talking about that that he's 
speaking about, the very religious item of the day is going to be smashed and burned. That's amazing that when he speaks about something, he already sees it as being done. We look and go, man, that's, that's awesome. But violent rejection. Uh, as to killing someone, as in Jesus, caused that uh, Jerusalem to be smashed and burned. The way it says here in 7, the king was, uh, 7 of 22, the king was enraged and he sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city it's amazing that that all comes together in Luke 19 verse 26 and 27 he replied I tell you that everyone who has more has more will be given so if you have more, you're going to be given more for what's expected from you. And, and so if you have the word of God, you're going to be given more. But as for the ones, the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Even what they have will be taken. If you have absolutely nothing, even that can be taken away from you. That's hard to imagine when you have nothing for that to be taken from you. But when you have a piece of God's Word, you're going to get more. Why? Because you're leaning that way, because you're thinking that way, because you're talking that way, because you're hearing that way, and you're seeing that way. If you don't see any of these things, if you have nothing, Jesus says that you don't even come to me and get life. Come to me and get life. When you think about that, you know, we're alive, we move around, but we don't even have life without Jesus. What does that mean? That's not, that's just not the time here. That life with Christ gives us an eternity life, which is much bigger than what we have here, much bigger than what we can imagine as, as humans. I had uh, Pastor Larry one time took a spool of thread yellow thread and he said he he took a piece of it and tied a knot and he said see from here to here that's your life you were born and you died and then he took that spool of thread and went and he said that's eternity and it went all the way down to the back doors and rolled on through that was amazing for me, as a, as a young man, to, to see something like that made a lot more sense than somebody just telling me. Because you couldn't even see the spool anymore. It went out the door. I don't know, any of you visual people? Well, no, you aren't. I've been working on that. Hearing test is next. Okay, so... <clears throat> But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them. Wow, that's tough. That's tough right there. The enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them. Bring them here and kill them in front of me. We're talking about a violent, unaccepting revolt against Christ, right? In, <clears throat> does anyone have anybody in their life? That, uh, that doesn't want you to be, or a boss that you can't stand, or somebody in a high position that you can't stand. I'm waiting for somebody to start talking about the president. But you, you, somebody, I'm kidding. So somebody that you can't stand that you say, man, I just want that person out of here, done with, gone, finished. Bring them in front of me and kill them. I'll be happy then. I will know I'll have no one else against me. But if you have the Lord, more is going to be given to you. You won't get to that spot. You won't get to that spot with people. 
where you hate them so much. I know there's people that see somebody on TV speaking in a political arena, and they're like, oh, stomping, hey, who are you? That guy, I wish he'd just... That's the wrong heart. That's the wrong heart. We spoke uh, last week about praying positive for people. Being positive towards people. You know, people who you don't like, Lord, allow them to come into the saving knowledge of you. Make him the Christian man that you would have him be. So much so, and so much like that, that everybody will see and go, oh, there is a God, because that guy's a piece of work. And now he's not. Right, Reuben? Reuben? Amen. The closer. That's what we call him. So in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 and 20, 18 through 20. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Uh, Some translations, uh, King James says, uh, let us reason together. See, That's an awesome God that's going to come to you and say, let's sit down and figure this out, right? That's, that is such an opportunity that we don't take advantage of. Uh, That's part of this invitation. Let us settle the matter, the Lord says. Through your sins are like scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. You will eat the good things of the land. If you're willing, there's the word that everybody hates, obedient, right? Every wedding I've done, obedient, you want obedient, not? Usually the woman says, no, we'll go somewhere else. I don't want obedience in there. You know, we'll, we'll step around that. But it's a big part of oh, being obedient to someone means that you love them and you respect them. Correct? And if you can't love them and respect them, what does it say here? But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, I said that, but I'm not the mouth of the Lord. I'm a mouthpiece. There's many mouthpieces. You guys are mouthpieces. When you're speaking, this is from Isaiah, a mouthpiece. He heard God say this to him. He's saying it. Uh, You can see how the wrath of God is not a place you want to be. Not because you're too busy. Not because of anything. What, whatever could make you run to the wrath of God. What could? I, I can't come up with anything. Just complete ignorance, I guess. <clears throat> In verse uh, 8 through 10, here he says, Then he, he said to his servants, Uh, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. He's speaking about Israel at that time. I invited them first. They were, they're my people. They are refusing everything to do with me and my son. They are disqualified. They do not deserve to be invited. Isn't that crazy? It's beautiful for us. It's sorry for those that are still holding on to all that. That makes my heart hurt for them. Because they did not deserve it. So go into the streets. There's a street in the corners and invite 
to the banquet anyone you can find. This is where it opens up to the Gentiles, to all people, to all nations. Go to all the world. He knew already this was going to come to pass. He knew this had to happen. That's why Jesus came for this to happen. He's foretelling us a story here that's just beautiful when you put it all together. Into the streets. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find. The bad as well as the good. The bad as well as the good. Now we're sitting in a church right now. I'm going to tell you, there's bad people everywhere. Now I don't want to say anybody in this church is bad. But it tells us right there, you're, it's the bad and the good. They're all invited. Is that an awesome God or what? Because I was bad before I gave my life to the Lord. And now, sometimes I am bad. Sometimes I do wrong stuff. I talk to him and I get punished from her. So, <clears throat> it, it, it works. I mean, he takes care of it, right? He takes care of that too. <laughs> so in Luke uh, chapter 18, verse 9 through 11. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. You know anybody like that? Jesus tells this parable. I used it last week. I used it the week before. And I think I didn't use it for a couple of weeks before that. But I, I go to this a lot because we can get there. We can look down on people and think, you know, hey, I'm more righteous than you. I know what you should do. So listen to me. Or you're not listening to God. Well, I'm not God. If you listen to me, then all I'm supposed to do is point you to this so you can figure it out for yourself, right? Amen. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector over there. Do you know anybody like that? Have you ever been called a holy roller? Holier than thou? When you tell somebody, man, you, what you're doing is not right. I love you, but what you're doing is not right. Oh yeah, you're just a holy roller. You just think you're holier than thou. No, that's the Lord. Uh, I'm just following Him. Right? But people, when you get under their skin, they get angry and they come after you. You know, they come after God. That's what they're doing. They're coming after God because they're angry. They're coming into the light. Their evil is being exposed. It's being peeled back. God's showing them things and they don't like it. In uh, 11 and 12, we see that the king came in to see his guest and he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. Do I need to say anything about that? Yeah, okay, I will then. Um, <clears throat> so in these days, you know, and there, and there it flips flops around, but the Greeks had a tradition that when you came to one of their weddings, you put on a wedding garment. They they kept that. You had that. They they size you up. They put it on you, a robe or whatever, and you go in. Everything's provided. Remember, everything's done, right? 
So to say that the, in, the, in Jesus' days and the Jewish traditions, you didn't really see that, but he's saying everything's provided. Everything's prepared. Now go out into the streets and get everybody. Anybody who will come. So who's going to come? The people who don't have nothing else to do. Or they have absolutely nothing. Right? Maybe what they're wearing is what their clothes they're going to wear. So he's going to provide a robe. Wedding clothes for each person. You know? And we're not talking about just a... Just a tunic that you put on or, or a, a, a robe that you put on. We're talking about custom fit from our God. A robe that fits you. <clears throat> He's going to know what size you are if you're losing weight. He's going to know what size you are if you're gaining weight. Right? Custom for you. That's a mighty God. Amen? So, <clears throat> when... When we get to this part and we read that this guy, he doesn't have any clothes on, any wedding clothes on, that's where we're, that's the, the terminology that we come to. Everything's provided, so everyone that was coming to the wedding had the same clothes on that they were provided for the wedding, right? This one guy don't have anything on. How'd you get in here? How'd you get in here? I want to ask you today. We've been talking about this all all through as we've been going. And this is tough. But if if Jesus was to come and walk through here, would he stop and say, how'd you get in here? You don't have your wedding clothes on. You know, you have to think about that. So what would that entail? What would that entail? Uh, in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testified. This makes a lot of people very angry, right? This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. To all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Ouch. Right now, there's no difference in the color of our skin when God looks at us. There's no difference. What does He look at? He looks at the heart, right? He knows what's going on with the heart. He knows what's going on with my heart. He knows your heart. The skin don't matter. The tattoos don't matter. The haircut don't matter. The color of cut don't matter. Whatever it is. All those things don't matter. Your house, your money, your cars, none of that matters. He looks at your heart. Only your heart. So if your heart is doing any of these things, rebelling, uh, not wanting to be a under anyone's authority because I'm going to do my own thing. That's what this guy is, right? Yeah, I see they're going to... I'm just going to come in here and eat the food. I don't want to put that dress on. I don't want to put that on. What I'm wearing is fine. You're going to tell me that I'm not dressed properly to come in here? You know, I'm just going to do my own thing and that's the way it's going to be. I'm going to go in there and sit and eat the food. And the king said, no, you ain't. You're wrong, buddy. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10 and 11, we speak, he speaks about the same wedding clothes. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God. For he has clothed me with a garment of salvation. Amen. <clears throat> and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Where did the robe come from? It came from the king who's throwing the feast for his son. You know, we didn't go get it from the law. Right? As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, as a, a bride 
adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and the garden causes the seed to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations, before all nations, all colors, all creed, all languages you speak, all nations. It's open. The invitation is open to all. And it's interesting how he speaks about wedding clothes. And I put that in because we're speaking about wedding clothes. He gives you a robe of righteousness. There's people out there that will tell you, now see what you've done. You can't wear that robe. You can't have that robe on anymore. See what you did? Nope. You're, you can't do it. You can go sin. Oh, no. You got to get that robe's gone now, buddy. What are you going to do? You don't got no more righteousness. Let me ask you, truthfully, from your heart, where were you when he put a robe on you of righteousness? The worst. The absolute worst. At the bottom. The only way up was God. For me, all right? He put that robe on me when I was at the worst place in my life. There's people that will tell you if you say, do, think, act, you lose that. Oh, give me that robe back. When does he take the robe back in this parable? He don't. Right? It goes with him. In Revelations, where does that robe go? With you. It's on you. It's yours. It goes. You're, you're going to the new Jerusalem. Amen? Sorry if I get a little bit uh, distracted. I'm almost out of time. Anyway, we started late. I'll take up. Anybody give me five more minutes? Five, ten, fifteen? <laughs> no? All right. So in 13 and 14 here, this man's been plucked out. God, see, the king is the one who saw him and said, why aren't you wearing the clothes, right? None of the guests come over, hey, you know what? You're not wearing the clothes, right? None of the guests, none of the servants went running to the king. Hey, it was the king who saw it, right? The only one that can see it. We see brothers and sisters in Christ. We see love. We see hugging on one another. But He sees the heart. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know who's among us, right? They may be wearing a robe, but it's not made of the same fabric as the one that Jesus is hanging out. The one that He's giving. So in 13 and 14, it says, Then the king told the attendant, attendants to tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where have you heard that? We don't, you know, don't have a lot of hell and fire preaching anymore. You just got to read that. That's where the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I, I don't even know, I can't even say to you that there's a constant fire and you're never going to burn up, but it's always going to be super hot. I can't tell you that. I can tell you what I know from reading God's Word. The weeping and the gnashing of teeth means there's a party going on and you can see it but you can't go to it. Why didn't I do that before I ended up over here? Now I can't get over there. But I can watch it, and I can hear it. I can smell it, but I can't go because of the decision that I made. Because of whatever reason, I was too busy. I'm not yet. Is anybody following me? In 14 it says, but many are invited and few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. This is a warning. This is a warning to us. (coughs) 
that uh, there is a place where you can end up that you will not want to be. And everyone is invited. And some people, some churches, some religions, not everyone's invited. The God that we serve, I'm assuming all of you serve the same God I do. Everyone's invited. Even the guy who cut you off on the way to church. Or the lady that was behind you honking her horn all the way. Because you were driving too slow. Even those people. Even the people who cut in line. One day they'll be standing in a line. I hope you're behind them. <laughs> Luke 14, 8 through 11. This is the last scripture I'm going to put up here and sew this thing up. When somebody invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. Who could say something like that but Jesus Christ? Right? No, I want to sit at the front. I want to be right up there where I want to get real close to the buffet. No. <clears throat> if so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliate, humiliated, you will have to take a lesser important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when the host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up here, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. So, this is speaking about being humble. Uh, being humble and he'll lift you up, right? Right? He'll put you in that place where you need to be. He'll use you for things. But if you rebel and you resist and you can't be humbled, that's the type of person that will go and run and sit. This is my spot. This is where I'm going to be. And Jesus is not that guy. He wants us to understand that to be lonely in heart and know that you need Him Know that your righteousness is worth nothing. Filthy rags. His righteousness is worth everything. You've been invited. And come in, take a seat. So what does that say? It says that the, it's the place should fill up from the back to the front. You ever see things fill up to, from the back to the front? Besides movies, theaters, you know? Usually not. That's why in a restaurant, you, the little restaurant, seat yourself. But big restaurants, you don't seat yourself. They don't want everybody sitting right by the lobster tank or right, you know, by the bar or right by the bathroom. They got to move you around. Anyways, you have been invited. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't take the invitation. If you say, I can't afford it, he paid for it. Everything's done. I can't afford the robe. He's going to give it to you. Uh, I can't find it. I can't find the address. I was going, but I couldn't find the address. Wow, that's a good one, huh? Uh, all you got to do is come to him. Right? All you got to do is come to the Lord. Come and ask for help. Come and ask to be cleansed. Or you can say, I'm not ready yet. I'm just not ready yet. I just don't have the, I don't understand enough about this thing to try to do this or what. I can tell you this. I am a member and gone through membership classes to almost every church there is. And all of that, I can tell you one thing. 
What did Jesus say? Follow me. Follow me to this building where you're going to be a member of this church. No, he said, follow me. He, he didn't say, follow me and then separate. He said, follow me. So if they're doing something over there, or doing something over there, if they're doing it for God, then it's going to be a good thing. If they're doing it for themselves, then they'll probably have more people than we do. Because they might be telling you what you want to hear. They might be just giving you entertainment. God's people love the truth. But the worldly people do not like the truth. They don't like it one bit. It doesn't fit. But if you say, I'm not ready yet, you might as well just say, no. I'm not going to, I don't want that. I don't want that. Because you can have as much of God as you want. Always and forever. Apart from Christ, everything I am and have is filthy rags. But with Him, I have the best of everything. So you have been invited. Do you have your wedding clothes? Do you want to take your seat at the table? Do you accept the invitation? Or you just don't have enough information yet? Not sure. Today's the day to be sure. Salvation is here. Today is the day. Jesus loves you and He wants nothing more to hear from His people. He wants you to talk to Him. He, praying and talking to God is something that... Uh, well, you know when your grandkids call you and you just kind of light up? It's better than that. You know when, you're, when your kids call you you haven't heard from them in a long time. And then you light up. Hi. You know. My son. Hadn't seen him for a long time. And it was like, I don't even care if he yells at me when he calls me. I don't even care if he walked up here and hit me in the face. I know I'm going to get to hug him before he leaves. Right? Better than that. More exciting than that when you pray and you conversate with Him and you share with Him. Not that you're trying to get something. But let me just tell you today, these people, and as we were reading in Exodus, Passover, they were to eat with their garments on. With their sandals on. And their staff in their hand. Eat in haste. Because you don't know when you're going to go. Is there anyone that could call you and say, hey, I need help. And you get up and you say, look, i got to go. i got to help them. Is there anyone in your life that way? I'll go, if you need help, I'll go help you whatever you need. Yeah? Some of us have people like that. Take that person and just push them back a little bit. Put God there. He's telling you, Come. The invitation is there. Get up. Drop everything and do it. Don't wait. Because you're not going to fix anything. He's the one that fixes stuff. He's the one that strips it away from you. He's the one that loves you no matter what you look like. Or what you smell like. I'm going to close this out here in prayer. If anybody needs anything, they want to come up to the altar here. You want to come up and take communion with me afterwards? <coughs> That'll be fine. Don't leave unless you leave everything at the altar and all your burdens and cares with the Lord. That's what I encourage for you today. Father, we just thank You for this day. We thank You for the life that You've given us, Lord. Just uh, We thank You for the Word that You gave us, Lord. We just ask that as we read, You would teach us how to use it 
in this world, in this life that we're living here now. Because we know that once we're with You, Lord, we won't need any of this. There will be no need for preaching. There will be no need for repenting. All those things will be done in our lives. And then it will just be worshiping You. Lord, allow us to learn that and start to worship You here in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Let us shine so that people will know that we've been with Jesus. We thank You. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And His church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call, 682-327-7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?